Right. Yep. So this is a, this is just a little bit again about what we're going to talk about today. Healthcare sustainability programming at Carillion, greenhouse gas accounting and decarbonization, and then uh, clinician engagement. So first, I just want to start with a little bit of background. Um, what we know is that the environmental impact of the U.S. health sector is significant. Um, in fact, the highest contributions to the global healthcare climate footprint come from the United States. We generate 11,725 tons of waste per day. Uh, we use eight and a half percent of the nation's energy. If when we compare healthcare emissions by country, we are the world's number one emitter in both absolute and per capita terms. And according to Practice Green Health, um, hospitals generate about 46 pounds of waste per patient day. Uh, so just for fun, this is our amazing and endlessly patient uh, sustainability program manager sitting next to 46 pounds of medical waste. Um, for perspective, we have 229,000 patient days per year. So what that means is every day that there's a head in the bed, uh, we generate this volume of waste across the system. What do you do with it? Do you recycle? Yes, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you everything about what we're doing with it. Um, so with this environmental impact, public health impact, financial impact, and many other considerations in mind, um, in 2015, Carillion signed the Healthier Hospitals Executive Commitment Statement, which committed the system to creating a comprehensive program of environmental sustainability with sustainable, measurable outcomes. Uh, to integrating sustainability into our core business strategies and to tracking and sharing results with both internal and external stakeholders like yourself. So a question I'm often asked when I talk about developing this program is, um, where did you start and why? And I always say in healthcare, at least, waste is an easy place to start. Um, we generated a combined 7.9 million pounds of waste from our seven hospitals in 2022, and every single piece of this moved through someone's hands in some fashion. Um, I always say waste is tangible, waste is relatable, waste reduction strategies are often low cost and demonstrate some type of quantifiable financial return, so it's a great place to start in sort of building the case for a larger program in a healthcare system. Um, some of our early wins uh, in the between about 2015 and 2020 um, were standing up recycling programs at six of our seven hospitals, which in 2015 there were none. So we're start we're starting from that. Um, decreasing food waste through some food waste reduction programs by 25,000 pounds a year. Um, we set up a mission donation program. So I like to qualify this for anyone who's ever been to the hospital, worked in the hospital. Um, visited a hospital, you, you would know that there's um, a, a vast amount of unopened, unused medical supply and equipment that ends up in the trash every day for a number of reasons. Um, and so what we did when we started this program was we set up what we call a mission donation program. So we're able to capture that product before this clean product, before it ends in the trash. And we partner with international aid organizations and um, local medical schools and nursing schools, regional nursing schools um, to donate that unused product and uh, equipment if they can use it. Um, and that program has diverted 172,000 pounds from uh, landfills. We've been growing battery recycling, increasing from 1,500 pounds to 13,000 pounds of batteries collected from our largest hospital, which is Roanoke Memorial in Roanoke. Uh, we recycled 18,000 pounds of soft plastics, which you can see here um, in the photo with the, um, the team from PACU. Um, soft plastics are just uh, ubiquitous in healthcare. It is abs they're everywhere in healthcare. And so um, capturing that and the ability to recycle that is really, we, we're really excited about that program. That's, we've been able to tackle 18,000 pounds of that waste. And then we've done two community electronics recycling events uh, in the last year. And from those, we were able to collect 72,000 pounds of electronics from community members to get them into the hands of electronics recyclers so that they weren't disposed of improperly and um, contributing to um, air pollution, soil pollution, water pollution. Other early areas of work that we did was um, also in, in the energy space. Uh, we've been upgrading all of the lighting in our hospitals to LED and are almost complete with those projects over the last probably, I'd say 10 years we've been doing that work. 
Um, Roenick Memorial, our, again, our largest facility, retrofitted the entire building with LED bulbs, uh, which was about 30,000 bulbs, which was one of my favorite projects. Um, we have a solar tracking field that was built by our colleagues up at New River Valley Medical Center, your, your space. Um, Franklin Memorial, which is in Rocky Mount, uh, they've been doing a ton of work on their mechanical systems over the years, and their um, engineers up there were able to save about approaching 16,000 gallons of fuel oil um, per year, enough to heat 31 homes a year. And then always we try to shine a light on the work of our engineers and our maintenance um, teams, which can really be the unsung heroes that are just quietly doing the work in the mechanical spaces behind the walls. Um, and so we get those buildings Energy Star certified, and which just goes to show that we have, um, as compared with other hospitals of similar size and function, that we have fewer operating costs fewer greenhouse gas emissions and um, using less energy when we're able to get those buildings certified. So just celebrating those guys. <clears throat> Another big part of our role since um, starting this program has been employee engagement, which is really important when you're in a healthcare system, the size of Carillion is getting the staff engaged and bought into these processes. Um, staff engage with us through the formal programs that we already talked about, like recycling and energy use and things like that. But then we also do a lot of work to really just engage them socially. So we do campus cleanup days, we do sustainability hero awards, um, Earth Week events, we do the um, soft plastics that we were recycling program. Those are turned into um, benches made of that recycled content. And so we have those. Um, we have, we host a climate and health conference for, um, our employees and also for other health systems in the area. And if you are a physician or faculty from tech at the time, um, they came in and they were able to speak for us, native planting days. We most recently launched Start Greening the Office program, which is designed for administrative offices. So all to say that we just do a lot of work to let people know, um, our employees know kind of what we're doing. We're trying to do our best um, and to get them engaged and excited. And really we find that that is um always beneficial because it aligns with the values of so many of our employees um, and it gives them a way to feel in this system, this process, this um, um, this this area of the industry that can be so polluting, it really helps them to um, assuage some of the that anxiety that can it can cause. And then, so what's next? In um, early 2021, we worked with 19 leaders from across the system after doing some of that baseline work that I was telling you about um, to set goals for the next several years to have clear direction and organizational alignment and the goals that we came up with. So this has been what this is what we've been working on um, for to hopefully be completed by 2025. Um, that's a 20% recycling rate compared to total waste across all hospitals. Um, evaluating composting opportunities with the goal of a pilot reducing the volume of blue wrap entering the landfill, which I can tell you more about later, um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions from waste and aesthetic gases, which is the gases that they use in the ORs, and then reducing average energy use across all hospitals by an additional 3% by 2025. And I said an additional 3% because our facilities guys have been doing this work, like I said, for, for a, a decade or more now. And they're, so it's continuing to sort of raise the bar a little bit. So, with all this work in place um, and all of these projects that we've been doing and this really, this through the lens of sus healthcare sustainability, um, there's concurrently been major movement in the industry. Um, and we have also started to build the case for a decarbonization strategy. Um, this is what I wanna kind of turn to now. So I just wanna take a step back and look at the broader landscape as opposed to just Carillion. It's our role in the Department of Sustainability to keep key stakeholders aware of the national landscape. So risks and trends in healthcare sustainability. And what we see and hear is a rapidly growing conversation around decarbonization, climate change, and greenhouse gas emissions. It seems like since 2020, it's it's been there prior to 2020, but really since 2020, at least in, in my sphere, it seems like the conversation just really took off. Um, the Joint Commission, which is one of our major regulatory bodies, is developing a new, new climate-related hospital accreditation standards. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, um, in partnership with the White House, launched the Health Sector Climate Pledge, which includes a 50% greenhouse gas emission reduction by 2030. 
Um, CMS released an RFI seeking input on how healthcare providers can more effectively respond to climate risks and reduce their emissions and how HHS can support them. And the SEC released its proposal in 2022 to require public companies to disclose their greenhouse gas emissions and exposure to climate risks, which I recognize as pertinent to public companies and we're a not-for-profit healthcare sector, uh, uh, healthcare system, as many are. Um, but the point is the regulatory machines are moving, I'm thrilled to say, and it is very reasonable to think that these requirements will trickle over into the not-for-profit sector. So all of that to say, um, we proposed and Carillion's Environmental Stewardship Executive Oversight Committee agreed um, that it would be wise to anticipate a carbon report, a requirement for carbon reporting in the near future. So to that end, um, we began to work on our establishing our first ever enterprise-wide carbon footprint for scopes one, two, and three. Um, what we believe this will um, provide us with is the ability to understand our driver, the drivers of our emissions and areas of opportunity to improve. And when the organization is ready to set decarbonization goals, or is called to do so by one of the regulatory agencies I was just talking about, um, we will not be flying blind. We will have this kind of um, system already in place to do this, this calculation. Um, so one of the parts in convincing the system to, to get this done that we had to do quickly was to educate folks internally um, on what does that mean? What is a greenhouse gas, what does greenhouse gas accounting for a system look like? Um, so this just really quickly, these are the three scopes. There's scope one, which, some many, if not all of you may already be familiar, so I'm not going to linger here very long, but scope one are the emissions that arise directly from our um, facilities. So things like um, natural gas that we burn to heat our buildings or the gasoline or diesel from our fleet, like our ambulances, shuttles and trucks. Waste and aesthetic gases, which I was talking about, which is the gas that they use to put you to sleep um, in the OR. That unused gas that's exhaled by the patient is vented directly from hospital rooftops to the outdoor atmosphere. Um, refrigerants and coolants that are inadvertently link from our HVAC. So all of those things are direct emissions from our, from our buildings. Scope two are the emissions that we cause indirectly through the consumption of acquired energy. So all the electricity that we purchased for um, the buildings within our scope for our boundary, I should say, for, for the year. And then finally is scope three, which we learned once we started doing this exercise is just an entirely different beast. Scope three is um, massive. So these are all the remaining emissions that Carillion causes indirectly that are not energy related. So examples of that would be purchased materials, kind of what are we buying from whom and how much, business travel, the volume and type of waste we generate, and the treatment of that waste, which you've already seen is massive. Um, and investments are, are a few examples of what goes into our scope three calculation. So once we have scopes one through three calculated, and I'll say this, we've been working, my program manager and I have been working on that um, calculation for 14 months now. Um, we are we have one little piece of the pie left um, to figure out. We anticipate to have that final calculation um, within probably a month or two. And then the question becomes, then what, right? Like once you have the number, the big number, then what? So what we will do then is to use this information to help educate leadership and other stakeholders on mitigation strategies, because our leaders are experts in healthcare administration. They're some of the best in the country, but they are not, um, they are not experts in greenhouse gas accounting, decarbonization strategies, or, um, you know, any, or um, climate change. And so it's our job to, raise awareness and to help them understand what that path forward looks like. So some of the mitigation strategies for that can be um, increasing energy efficiency and reducing this waste and acidic gases that we were talking about. And the good news there is that as I showed you from the goal slide, I'm able to say to the, those leaders, you already approved that work. We're already doing that work. We're, we're killing it. We're doing it. Um, look at these. My hope is that when we do 2021 to 2022, which is the next year that we'll calculate, um, that we'll be able to say, we've already, you've already, we can already see these reductions and to get them excited and bought in from that perspective. And then we can bring forward some of these more aggressive concepts like electrification of fleet and transportation, increasing on-site solar, um, wind that, uh, I maybe should take that off. I don't know how much opportunity for wind there is in the area. I just am unfamiliar with that. 
And then scope three, this is where it really gets into like an all hands on deck approach to make emissions reduction in the long run is what I'll be helping them to see and to understand. So things like environmentally preferable purchasing standards, comprehensive transportation programs to minimize the number of single occupancy occupancy vehicles. So really big, really ambitious system-wide strategies that are going to absolutely take all of our highest levels of leadership um, to come to the table to help us uh, reduce those emissions. And, and the good news is there's money to do this work, right, with the IRA. Um, the IRA is the strongest U.S. climate action ever with $369 billion in strategic investments over the next 10 years to drive the growth of clean energy and cut the nation's carbon footprint. You know this. Um, and so, But the interesting thing is that um, this hasn't been translated yet within our institution. So we're, we're bringing our tax department to the table. We're bringing our engineering department to the table. We're trying to get all of these folks communicating so that we can help to um, show our leadership that there could be, if not an, a, a more expeditious ROI on some of this very expensive work that would have to happen. And then, so that's kind of operationally what's been going on and what's been happening in the facility on the facility side. So I just want to turn quickly to clinician engagement because it's more than just about mechanical systems, like I said, and um, waste reduction. There's also we have clinicians in our system in our healthcare system. Um, and again, that's where I met uh, my new friend, John Ashburn, um, was with in Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action. So I'm going to pivot now a little bit and talk about their work. Um, I um, have been a member of VCCA for three, going on four years now. And um, so I hope I'll represent them well. And if certainly I just premise, preface this by saying if there's any questions that I can't answer, I know they would be very happy to come and, and meet with you guys and talk to you guys. Um, but VCCA is um, a group of over 500 members um, of clinicians, all licensed healthcare pro pro um, providers and trainees. There's physicians, nurses, ACPs, clinical pharmacists, psychologists, therapists um, from across the state. And they are represent. They have representation in Northern Virginia, Richmond, Charlottesville, Roanoke, and Hampton Roads. So a nice swath of the state. Um, their mission is to um, educate and mobilize clinician leaders to bring the health voice to climate policymaking in Virginia. And their theory of change, I think, is really wonderful. And that is that clinicians have the knowledge and mission to play a vital role in protecting the health of Virginia's families and communities from the effects of climate change. Um, this clinical voice can overcome entrenched partisan and economic barriers by focusing on the health benefits of climate solutions and the health dangers of inaction. So um, it's a really beautiful uh, theory, I believe, and vision. So VCCA believes that the role of clinicians on a warming planet falls into three categories of, um, of engagement for these clinicians, as educator, as advocate, and as a uh, clinician. So first, and I just want to kind of briefly touch on what those three pockets of work look like, but I'm not going to go too far into the weeds because, again, there's just a whole entire story behind that, but we can certainly, I would love to open the door for a continued conversation, but um, first, just to clarify, as educators, um, as clinicians, uh, clinicians have to learn themselves how the changing climate influences the health of people, right? This is a new topic because it's a fairly new problem. Um, the great news and something that I think think you, this group particularly, will find very encouraging is that climate change is now rapidly being incorporated into medical education and schools of health training across the country. So perhaps most visibly, um, there's Harvard Medical School announced recently that they will integrate climate change into its curriculum. Um, George Washington University has done the same. Columbia University is an international consortium on climate and health. And there's many other programs across the country, as you see here, um, that are being launched in both the United States and internationally. So um, I, I just find that incredibly encouraging. And VCCA is doing their part to bring this work to Virginia. So, and to Virginia higher education, VCCA student and physician members have developed three climate and health electives at two medical schools in Virginia, UVA and VCU. Um, and one physician assistant program at Shenandoah University, which, I, and I think this is really cool. So UVA School of Medicine, the Climate and Health Elective, fills to capacity 
um, when they open, when it opens for registration with 20% of the medical school class electing to take the course. So there is a deep and um, desire, desire and drive um, by these medical students to understand this. And I just, I think that's fantastic. And the climate curriculum integration is now being evaluated at UVA. Um, so a lot of, a lot of hope in that. Um, and then there's the role of the advocate. So VCCA advocates for state climate policies that protect the health of our patients and communities. Um, every year they gather in Richmond to meet with legislators at the General Assembly in support of climate solutions. Um, this year they had about um, 65, I believe, attendees and held dozens of legislator meetings. It was a, it was a really great day. And then just as another example of some of the advocacy that they do, VCCA has worked with a faculty member and his students at the UVA Environmental Law Clinic to draft comments which were submitted to the State Air Pollution Control Board in opposition to the governor's call to remove Virginia from Reggie. Um, and VCCA steering committee member and VCU medical student leader um, that you see in this photo participated in a press conference with partners in support of VCCA's continued um, support of Virginia's continued participation in the Reggie program. So, um, so I'm, I have here uh, Dr. Bob Kitchen's contact information. He really is the expert in the advocacy arena for VCCA and has offered to arrange a conversation with you around advocacy. He, as it happens, he's also a member of your group of CCL. Um, so he comes with a bit of background on the work of your group, but he is, um, he is uh, eager to, to connect to have more conversation. And then finally, there's the clinician role. And again, this is where John and I met. Um, I uh, head with two physicians from uh, INOVA in Northern Virginia, a brand new committee to Virginia Clinicians for Climate Action on Healthcare Sustainability. Um, and the goal of that committee is to help to bring together clinicians um, working in healthcare, um, whether it's in hospitals, outpatient, nursing homes, whatever that might look like, who have an interest in increasing um, the um, environmental sustainability of their medical facilities and don't really know how to do that or what to do. So it's our it's our our vision um, that we can bring these folks together, that we can help um, educate folks on what does sustainability look like in in um, in healthcare. What are some projects that clinicians can do? They sometimes feel like I have all this passion and I want to do something, but I don't know what to do or where to start. And so we can plug them in. We wanna bring in experts from healthcare sustainability across the state. We wanna um, have other clinicians from Virginia presenting on the work that they're doing so that um, we can take that and kind of um, um, maybe spread that work to other healthcare systems. And so we can have this collective effect within Virginia. Um, so it's again, a brand new, we've only met twice. Um, we're still very much in our infancy and kind of stumbling around and trying to figure out how to make this work, but um, it's, a, it's a great group. And then the last slide that I'll have, and then I'll close and I'll stop talking, um, is uh, it's just a, sh a shameless plug um, of something I need your help with. Uh, we are doing an e-recycling event this weekend. We at Carillion, um, sorry, back to Carillion, are doing an e-recycling event um, in Blacksburg this weekend. Um, we are asking that you would please share with your networks the flyer um, that um, I believe she was going to include with the meeting materials. These are the social media links or just drive through, come join us, drop off your electronics. Um, our past events, like I said, we've had two um, in Roanoke. They were both in Roanoke and they raised uh, a total of about $9,000 for Carillion's new cancer center and recycled 72,000 pounds of electronics waste, which we really love getting that out of the hands. Uh, I mean, out of the hands of consumers who don't know what to do with it. And then it either clutters up their home or we risk it going to the landfill where it isn't, which is not proper disposal. Um, and risk contamination of um, soil and groundwater. So we hope that you can help us spread the word. Um, and that's my contact information. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see your faces. Um, and uh, please, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions or um, set up further conversation in the future, whatever is helpful to you all. And thank you so much for having me tonight.